All right, uh, welcome to our 19th fireside chat. I'm Teresa Mears, a project architect at LGA. Our fireside chats are about connection, connecting with our community and connecting with experts to learn how we can better impact positive change in the places we live and work. Our previous fireside chat discussed urban placemaking and how tools like form-based code can help create urban spaces that are dynamic and human-centric. Today, we will learn about the impact that our own workspaces have on us and how we can improve the impacts of the workplaces that we design for others. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us in this opportunity for curiosity and learning. Before we jump in, let's cover some logistics. The webinar format mutes all participants, so we encourage you to ask questions throughout the talk by using the Q&A function. I will be monitoring the incoming questions and direct them to our presenter when appropriate. If you missed something, don't worry. We are recording this chat, so you'll be able to watch it again. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can reach out to LGA on our social media outlets, by email, or by contacting us on our website. Today's fireside chat is titled, Well at Work, Creating Well-Being in Any Workplace, named for the title of our panelists' latest book. I will hand it over to Jason to introduce today's guest. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, my name is Jason Georgiorian, and I'm one of the principals at LGA Architecture. And I get the esteemed honor of introducing Dr. Esther Sternberg. Uh, so a little bit of background information on her first. Um, Dr. Esther Sternberg is internationally recognized for her discoveries in the science of mind-body interaction in illness and healing and the role of place in well-being. She is a research director of the Andrew Weil Center for Integrated Medicine and founding director of the University of Arizona Institute in Place, Wellbeing and Performance. She holds the inaugural Andrew Weil Chair for Research in Integrative Medicine and is a research professor of medicine with joint appointments as professor in psychology, architecture planning, and landscape architecture. Dr. Sternberg's Three popular, highly popular books uh, are easily read and are scientifically based books and are inspirations for laypersons and professionals alike. Her words answers complexities and 21 first century frontier of stress, place, healing, and wellness. This session session will explore her latest, uh, the, her award winning book, Well at Work Creating Well Being in Any Workspace. This work was named a top 10 um, lifestyle book for fall 2023 by Publishers Weekly and received the OWL Award, a uh, long list award. The OWL Award uh, stands for the Outstanding Works of Literature. Uh, it's a great read and uh, we use that as prep for today's topic. Um, this is just a short sampling of all our many achievements, um, but you know, we we better get to it because uh, there's a lot of lot to cover. I want to hear from Esther herself. Um, Esther, it's been a few years since our last fireside chat. We were just catching up on that, and uh, we're excited to welcome you again. And so, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you. It's it's a pleasure. So um, last time we spoke uh, in our fireside chat, and by the way, you're one of our very few returnees, so it's, <laughs> we're happy to have you. And um, as I share, one of, one of my personal favorites, uh, our first time. I expect uh, that's going to happen again today. Um, last time we covered, we learned so much about healing spaces. Um, and there are some common themes with today's topic to healing spaces. Mm -hmm. However, um, and this is a book title you can see here, uh, the cover of the book, Healing Spaces, The Science of Place and Well-Being. Um, today, uh, you know, we're, gonna, we're moving on to your latest book, as we mentioned, and it, that has to do with well-being at the workspace. Will you please explain what motivated you to write your new book on the subject of well-being? Well, I uh, there were several things that motivated me uh, to write the book. Um, the first thing was working with uh, the U.S. General Services Administration for over 23 years 
measuring the impact of built office spaces on health, well-being, and performance using wearable devices um, to measure various aspects of health, including stress and relaxation response, physical activity, movement, sleep quality, um, and, uh, and um, various aspects of psychological uh, responses. Um, so I was steeped in, in that. I had been, uh, when I was at the National Institutes of Health for 26 years, prior to coming to the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine, I had been um, uh, working on stress and the stress response, and I had discovered that the brain's stress center is important in susceptibility uh, to autoimmune inflammatory diseases in rats. And when you can prove that in rats, uh, then it becomes clear that the science of the mind-body connection is real, that the brain and the immune system talk to each other, and that if that connection is intact, you have health, and if it's broken, you have um, disease. But I didn't fully understand the, um, the role of stress and illness, uh, and certainly not the role of place and well-being, until I myself went through a period of extreme stress about eight or nine years after I discovered the, the importance of the stress center, brain stress center in autoimmune disease, went through a period of extreme stress and developed inflammatory arthritis myself, which was ironic because uh, I'm an, um, a rheumatologist, an arthritis doc. And uh, instead of going back into hospital, which I was supposed to do, I serendipitously um, went to uh, Crete, to a very tiny village in Crete with my neighbors uh, from my next door neighbors in Washington, D.C., and, um, and I healed. And what I didn't realize uh, was that I was practicing uh, integrative health. I was swimming in the ocean every day. Uh, I was uh, eating a healthy Mediterranean diet. I was climbing to the top of the uh, hill above the village where there was a ruins of a temple to the Greek god of healing, Asclepius, and where I, um, uh, where there was a tiny little Greek chapel and I, with icons and, and candles, and I'd sit there for hours, not really, I, not realizing I was meditating. And um, I was surrounded by the, my friends and the villagers who all um, cared for me, uh, were sympathetic about my arthritis. Um, and it was only when I came to the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine that I um, uh, that I learned that I had been practicing the seven core areas of integrative health: sleep, resilience, environment, um, movement, relationships, spirituality, and nutrition. And uh, we can talk more about that uh, as we, you know, have our conversation. But um, I. Uh, I think that uh, it was only by really experiencing this myself that I fully appreciated um, the role of place and well-being. That is, what uh, what was I doing, and what was it about that environment that helped me heal? Right, and th thank you for explaining. So this is, sounds like is part of a almost a life journey, life's work for you over the time, and I, I think that was one of the key takeaways too. And I think where you send a lot of your research uh, over the years is on, on place effect on our well-being. And I think that is probably the, one of the key points uh, that I take away from your work is our, our, our environmental influences, our stress, influence our stress levels directly and our yeah. built environment or the things we surrender with, with is the, one of the very few things we have complete control over yes and i uh, and i think that's a key point um uh, that you make in your book and i don't know if you want to talk a little bit about more of that like what what is it about that and i think it resides in these seven domains too yes uh, and you know it, it grows as you said from both my personal experience but also the research i was doing with the u.s general services administration um, where we found in office workers, we we studied. Well, let me uh, let me go back to the beginning of that. Um, in the book, I I, talk, I think about the book as a kind of a sandwich. At the beginning of the book, I talk about how I got into this and the colleagues that came together across many di disciplines, 
building science, uh, architecture, psychology, uh, engineering, medicine, to and big data analytics to um, to really create a, a prescription for a healthy building. Um, and we started this work in the year 2000 when Kevin Campshur, who was then director of research for the US General Services Administration, um, came to me at NIH, at National Institutes of Health. So we were both in sister agencies. And he asked me if I could help him measure the impacts of the built environments that he was overseeing. As all you know, designers know, the GSA uh, builds and operates all non-military federal buildings. Um, all your courthouses, um, um, libraries, embassies around the world, and so on. And he wanted to know how to keep the workers in those spaces happy, healthy, and ultimately productive. And so we started by using a wearable device back in 2000. This was just a, the sort of dinosaurs of wearable devices then. <laughs> You know, the uh, a wearable heart rate variability now is as small as a ring or as, you know, large as a watch. But the um, size of the the uh, heart rate variability monitors back then were the size of this this glass, and you wore it on your chest with wires glued to your chest and hanging off of it. And but nevertheless, we we measured workers in a federal building in Denver that was being retrofitted, and uh, we found that the workers in the old space in the um, um, uh, legacy space that was dark, it didn't have access to sunlight or views, it had um, poor airflow, it was musty, it had high mechanical noise, six foot high wall cubicles, um, you know, it was a horrible space. Mm -hmm. And we measured the workers in that space and in the new space that was light and airy and open office design with views of the mountains and circadian light <clears throat> and um, a good airflow and lower mechanical noise. And to my surprise, and I don't know why I was surprised, um, the workers <laughs> in the new space were significantly less stressed using these objective measures of the stress response, mm -hmm. as well as salivary cortisol, which is the hormonal response. So we had two different objective measures of the stress response, and people were significantly less stressed in the new space than the old space. And their stress response was significantly lower even when they went home at night mm -hmm. and even while they were sleeping. So that was, to me, an aha moment where I realized that you really do take your office space home with you at night. But the really interesting thing about that study is that people didn't even consciously, they weren't even consciously aware that the, the old space was stressing them. Um, and I think it's because people just get used to where they are. They, mm -hmm. they assume that this is how it should be. But you know, the fact is we spend 90%, over 90% of our time indoors. And as you said, the um, we can control, we can't control all the stressors of the world. I mean, forget about it, don't even try. But you can control the environment, the local environment in which you work. And so that really opened my, my eyes to that. Um, so we published that paper in 2010. And then in 2012, I moved to the University of Arizona to the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative mm -hmm. Medicine to create a research program. And I continued collaborating with Kevin Kampscher, who by then was the uh, Director of High Performance Federal Green Buildings for the GSA and the Chief White House Sustainability Officer for the GSA. And he, we used the state-of-the-art wearables, uh, chest-worn small device, um, and linked to up to 11 different environmental attributes that we measured in real time with a company from the Bay Area called Acloma, who de designed the, the sensors. And uh, with big, big data analytics, we were able to really tease apart um, what elements of the built environment affected the stress response, physical activity, uh, movement, um, and sleep quality, and came up literally with a prescription for a healthy well-being building, because we also asked people how they felt in those spaces. So all of that really um, cemented in my mind the importance of designing for well-being, for health and well-being. And then there was a third thing, which was COVID. Mm. <laughs> a big thing. Right. <laughs> um, 
So, you know, everybody I'm sure remembers at the beginning of COVID seeing all the frightening pictures on the internet, the animations and videos of the spread of the virus through ventilation and uh, indoor environments. And then there were people sitting outdoors in the middle of winter eating on the sidewalk. Uh, and why is that? Ventilation is absolutely essential for uh, reducing the dose and duration of exposure to a virus. So whether you're whether you get sick from any virus depends on the dose to which you're exposed, the duration of exposure, and your own resilience. So ventilation is essential for reducing that dose and duration, as is distancing and masking, filtration, HVAC filters, you know, and Non-design professionals, non-building scientists didn't know what an, a MERV-13 filter was. I can tell you what <laughs> about MERV-13 filters. But so that's essential. That's the basis. But you have to design the environment to optimize emotional well-being mm -hmm. in order to include all of those seven domains of integrative health to help people remain resilient. Right. And it... It's almost what your book does for for me in particular. It's it's like peeling away the onion. We to learn more. Like we totally know daylight is good for us. I I think as designers we we kind of understand that. But how much how much does affect all the facets of your life? You yeah. May not think about. And so that's what a lot of research brought to light uh, to us as we we looked into it. And. It's amazing. Ten years ago, we don't think about these things. We 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 accept conditions that are not ideal, but it's the more you know. It's like you you there's there's things we have to do if we want to live a healthy life and and reduce the amount of stress and and look at how do we reach peak performance. Is kind of want to lead the conversation into now is um, and I think this is related to a topic we talked about last time, but the idea that it's worth revisiting again. It just feels like a good thing to revisit is that stress is not good or bad, um, inherently good or bad. It's it's about the right amount of stress. And so can you, um, Teresa, I think we have a slide on this. Um, yes. So so can you can you revisit this idea that- Right. Uh, so, peak, yeah, so- How do we reach peak, peak performance? I'm sorry. You, no, no, that's, um, so, you know, you need your stress response for survival. It is not possible to create an animal of any sort without a stress response. So the stress response is what gives you the energy to fight or flee. It gives you the energy to the, the attention, focused attention and vigilance uh, to be able to accomplish the task in hand. And, and this is, you know, if you think about a field mouse in a field, if they have no stress response, they're gonna be half asleep and a cattle come along and uh, <laughs> they won't run away and the cattle eat them. So, uh, you know, it's the same for any uh, any animal in, including fruit flies, you know, from fruit flies to mice, to cats, to rats, to humans and everything uh, in between. So you need your stress response. So the goal is not to get rid of stress. The go and you can't, so don't even think about it. The goal is to have the right amount of your stress response to accomplish the task at hand. So in this figure that you see here, on the left-hand side, if you're totally relaxed, you're not performing, you're half asleep, you're pretending you're on the beach or reading, and your stress response is very low. In order to perform at peak, to you know, meet that deadline, uh, write that paper, work on that uh, design of your uh, buildings. Um, for me to speak to you, I have to turn my stress response on just right in order for it to um, give me that energy to accomplish the task at hand. The problem occurs if the stress response is too high for the given task or goes on too long. And then you fall over the edge of that rainbow uh, into extreme stress where you'll freeze, you won't be able to accomplish the task. Um, and if the st stress goes on too long, as happens, for example, with chronic caregivers of Alzheimer's patients or people going through a divorce, these are studies that have been done for uh, over the decades. That's the kind of stress, the cumulative stress uh, load that will make you sick. Mm. So the goal is to do as much as you can to move yourself back up that rainbow to the middle of the performance peak. And the environment plays a huge role in that, even if we're not consciously aware of it. 
Yeah, it, it seems we have enough outside influences without controlling some of it. We're going to hit this red level at times. And, um, you know, this, I think we mentioned this, uh, you and I talked about this not too long ago, but one of my favorite stories about peak performance I heard recently was the story of a coach telling his young player, a uh, soccer player, before she went out in the field. And he asked her the question, uh, are your butterflies in formation? So <laughs> how can that, how can your anxiety be thought of in a way internally that it's actually, no, this is actually, I need this energy um, to perform. Yes. And, I, and and you, it's a mind shift set sometimes. Right, absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, so we talked about this, like, well, what we're trying to do is, you know, adapt how we surround ourselves in built environment and us as designers, how do we create environments that, you know, help alleviate people who use these facilities or places that we create from reaching that other side of the rainbow, the downside of that rainbow. Um, and so what, what can we learn? And that's a lot of the content we want to get into today. Um, one thing about, you talk a lot about resilience and our body's ability to deal with search, uh, situations that are not ideal. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your book, you introduce the concept of habit habituation is our ability to um, deal with like a loud noise. If you start, to, you can start to adapt to that loud noise to more it off. The second time it happens, it's not necessarily as impactful as the first time. And, and you're able to over time overcome with through, I think it's a resilience factor of being able to withstand stress, but it also means we tell that story of our work environment we accept for years or a decade. What happens when we accept conditions that are not ideal and through yeah. that resilience? That's very, very, very important. So yes, in the book, I talk about, first of all, what is resilience? And, and the analogy that I give is, uh, think about uh, a, a new rubber band that you pull, you, you stretch, and it, and then you let go and it quickly snaps back. That's resilience. It's um, snapping back to your optimal self or your optimal health. Whether you're exposed to a physical stress or a, an emotional stress, um, your, your body has to mount a response. It, it, it responds to it in every way, both the stress response, the immune response, but then it needs to go back to your baseline. So that's resilience. Um, you think of a, an old played rubber band, you pull it and it just sort of, you let go and it's limp. So mm. that's not resilience. So, and, and then the question of how does the environment play into this? Well, there's no question that the environment can help enhance your resilience or it can impair it, whether you're consciously aware of it or not. I think that's the real important thing. So we talk about habituation. Now, habituation is also, it's a characteristic of the brain, which is absolutely necessary. And it occurs both on the whole um, behavioral level, the whole uh, cognitive level, and also single, single nerve cells habituate. So um, imagine if you couldn't habituate to a stressful event and you uh, didn't, you, you had the same amount of stress every time you're exposed to the same loud noise. Oh, mm -hmm. if you're exposed to a loud noise over and over and over and over again, and you have the same amount of, of stress response, that's not healthy either. And in fact, that's sort of what happens with people who have post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they don't habituate. Um, so there is a happy medium to habituating and, um, and, and not, um, but what's not good is if you're so used to working in a terrible environment, like the people that we studied at the very beginning, who weren't even aware of the loud noise of the musty mm -hmm. smells of the, um, you know, lack of light and, and yet their stress responses were very impacted. So right. there is that, that, um, happy medium between, habituating enough and not too much yeah i, I kind of seem to think do you ever reach the tipping point I mean, there's like analogies out there the like the boiling frog boiling frog analogy where you oh, don't yeah. know until it's too late right it's well yes it's absolutely yes that's the problem if if you go on so one of the things that we found with the with the follow-on study with the gsa is that people 
and I, again, I talk about all this in, in the, in the book, people who, um, um, were, um, exposed, who were, were moving more during the day, um, had 14% less stress at night on their stress response. They weren't aware, again, they were not aware of it. 14%. Imagine 14% more stress every single day of your life, of your working life. That's mm. a cumulative amount of stress that has a medical impact. Yeah. And, um, you know, and now the, why were they moving more during the day? The ones who were less stressed because they were an open office design. And we, <laughs> when we published our first paper on that in 2018, there was such a hue and cry on the internet about it. People hate their open office design. Mm. Well, why do they hate their open office design? First of all, open office design is a misnomer. It should, the, yes, if it's just a field of desks with no place to go, that's not good. But right. if you have lots of different kinds of spaces for people to go, depending upon their preference, their, their, um, their um, work that they're doing, the task at hand, the mood, um, their own uh, psychological makeup, um, then that's a beneficial action office design that helps people move more during the day. And the people who move more during the day were less stressed at night when they went home. They had better sleep quality. They were, and this is all using wearable mm -hmm. devices, so it's not asking them questions. We They had better sleep quality and they had... Um, uh, they woke up the next morning in a better mood and they were less fatigued at work the next day. So it all comes down to designing the office space. You, this is what I tell design <laughs> professionals, you are our partners in the health of this nation. Well, the health of this world, because I can't tell somebody to move more during the day if they go and sit in a private office uh, and have no place to move. So, um, yeah, you have a tremendous hey, control over this. Yeah, they're... Yeah, I feel we have a, a huge social responsibility as the designers of our built environment. And um, yeah. I think that drives us a lot to think about that and how the purpose we serve in, in our community. Um, you started to speak to uh, one area I think is maybe like everyone's different. People respond to things differently. Sure. And, and one of the things in these open work environments is creating different ways of working that people may be more comfortable with than, than the next person. So that was a big take home from these studies is that the spaces have to be designed for individual differences. And one of the things we found, and we asked people, we, we looked at uh, personality scores, uh, whether mm -hmm. they were more introverted, more extroverted. And we found that the people who were more introverted um, were more distracted, were more stressed in an open office setting. Uh, and the people who were more extroverted were actually more focused and, uh, and happier and less stressed in the open office setting. So, you know, I like to say the people who are sitting all day working in, in the coffee shop are probably the extroverts. I like to work with stuff going on around me. Um, and, and the other thing we found that was interesting was, um, so why is it that people hate their open offices? It's the noise. It's the noise distraction. And so we, our, one of our studies we just published last year, we, we delved into the data and, um, and we found that, uh, of course, we know that when it's too noisy in a space, when it's 80 or 90 decibels, it can occur in an emergency room or yeah. a, uh, an intensive care unit that's extremely stressful and it can damage your ears. Um, but it turns out that when the space is too quiet, um, less than 30 decibels, uh, people were also more stressed. And we, we mm -hmm. called it the well-being response improved as you increase the decibel level to about 45 decibels. And um, so that seems to be the sweet spot for mm -hmm. office setting uh, levels of noise. And I, this is actually, I know Teresa has a question, but I want to hold that for one minute because I think this topic was one of our next pieces we're going to dive into is acoustics. Um, for us, uh, COVID played a big factor into this. I think we didn't realize the importance of acoustics until we had a little bit more quiet setting at home, people coming back to the office and realize like, oh, wow, what am I coming back to? You know, at home, you can go outside, walk through a park, 
uh, hear nature noise. I think the, the kind of right level of uh, sweet spots that we're talking about, and then you come into a noisy office environment, the contrast right away uh, hit us. And then that was a, a really big play as we moved offices that that was a lot of our attention. Um, so um, I know we can get into some strategies of how to deal with that, but I, I think for us, spatial separation, having a little bit of separation and the options uh, for different places for people to go, um, private meeting versus uh, at, at their desk or um, because of the hybrid situation um, that we're still uh, partly in, um, it just played a huge role. Well, and I think uh, you're you're 100 right, and and that speaks also a bit to habituation. People after after working at home for three or four years, you get used to the quiet. If your home is quiet, now it may not be quiet. I was on sure. plenty of Zoom calls where people had young kids running running around and and crying and dogs barking and whatnot. But um, but you know there are acoustical engineers who know how to design spaces for exactly the right acoustical qualities that you might be interested in, mm. you know, a recording studio, a concert hall. Um, so if from the get-go you design the space to include noise absorbing features, and I know you have in your new office space, those beautiful felt uh, baffles on the uh, ceiling that they're also beautiful in addition to yeah. absorbing noise, but paying attention to these things from the get-go as you're designing the space is really important. And and every, I mean, as a designer, you know uh, that every right. material that you use has an acoustical um, rating and, and it can be done. In the book, I describe um, a call center in uh, Vermont's um, uh, Green Mountain Power, which um, uh, takes, which takes care of the power grid for the entire state of Vermont. You can mm -hmm. imagine in a snowstorm or a blizzard, uh, there's a lot of people calling in. And yet that call center was really quiet, even though it was open office mm. setting because they had cubbies, kind of like what you have behind you there, um, uh, and um, rubber flooring and baffles on the ceiling and, and so on. So right. th there are ways to address these drawbacks of spaces that are other way in other ways yeah. are helpful. yeah and there's also retrofits like there's existing spaces that can easily be outfitted with acoustical panels sound absorption materials and uh you're right we recently did that for one of our libraries we designed in arizona um that we had to come back and add the amazing six acoustical panels in a large open space and it transformed the whole experience at the front desk. And that's that's uh, fantastic. Yeah, well, there was a famous study in Sweden where um, the architects put acoustical panels on the ceiling in an intensive care unit and didn't tell the nurses and did mm. a study. Uh, and they found that the nurses had significantly uh, better quality of sleep when they went home if they were working in the area where there were acoustical panels. Mm. So yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So I think it's good good time to change uh, turn it over to Teresa. You have a question? Yeah, I think we, we have, have a few. A, there's a few questions from the audience. I think we uh, wanted to throw in that's a little relevant to what we have going on. Uh, when we're talking about acoustics or some of the other things that uh, we do in a built environment that impact wellness, a lot of times designers and engineers are looking to meet code and maybe are not looking beyond that. In your book, you talk about the important step between doing no harm and wellness. Um, what are some ways that you think the current approach of architecture or engineering is missing the mark in this aspect? Or are there important questions that uh, we could ask ourselves when we're trying to create a design for wellness? So, so this is a great way to time to introduce the slide that really is the, the meat of the book, the core of the book. I told you that at the beginning, I talk about how we all got together, all the researchers and building scientists and architects got together to, to do these studies. And in the middle seven chapters, I talk about how you embed the seven domains of integrative health that we mentioned at the beginning mm -hmm. into the built environment. So if you could just put that slide up. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this here. This is all in the book. You can <laughs> read about it. But, <laughs> but really, there are ways of embedding each of these domains into the built environment, 
if you think about it ahead of time, if you, you and, and not using code, uh, but there certainly are now many standard setting organizations that, um, that people can um, use to follow the guidelines and then have a label on the outside of the building. So of course there's U.S. Green Building Council's well, there's uh, FitWell, which started with the GSA and CDC uh, is now run by a nonprofit. Uh, there's Living Building Challenge that has been around for a long time, and UL is even getting into the act. So this is not code, but it gives it gives you guidelines of how to uh, really make sure that you're embedding these features of uh, wellness into the environment. And, and the difference of what I'm proposing here is I think a lot of code of health health code speaks to the physical environment. And, and that's really essential. You've got to make sure that the physical environment from the point of view of no toxins, you know, no off gassing, um, uh, no allergens, uh, no uh, uh, infectious agents like legionnaires and fungi and so on. You've got to make sure those are not there in the environment. That's essential. But you have to go beyond that. You have to go beyond that and design for well-being, for emotional well-being as well as physical health. And and what I I wrote an op-ed article for the Arizona Daily Star um, in response to an article that was published uh, saying that employers are now um, mandating people to go back to the office because they have all these empty office buildings. They're sitting there with a lot of square footage that's empty and people are not using it. And why should they pay the rent? And there's this economic, um, yeah, there, it's an eco it's really important. It's an economic yeah. issue because there's what's been termed the downtown apocalypse where organizations are shrinking their footprints uh, because people are not going into work. Um, Forbes did a, um, did a, um, a survey where they found that 98, per, this was published in June of 2023, 98% of people want to work hybrid. They want to have the option to work from home. Close to 60% of workers said that they would look for a new job if they didn't have the option to work from home. And 30% of workers said that they would leave their job if they didn't have the opportunity to work from home. That's a huge number. So how, how do you attract people to go back to work? It's great to have great ventilation, but that's not enough. So in the article that I, um, I wrote, uh, the, the op-ed piece, I said that I live about a 10 to 20 minute drive from five world-class spas in Tucson. Nobody is forcing people to go to those spas. Those spas were designed from the get-go to attract people to them and their program to attract people to them. 58 million people a year visit Disneyland. Nobody is forcing those people to go to Disneyland. But the, um, the Disney Imagineers back in the 1950s designed those theme parks to take people from a place of anxiety and fear to a place of happiness and hope. Mm -hmm. So it is entirely possible to do that. You're in Las Vegas, uh, you know, those those spaces are designed for other purposes, uh, you know, to get people yeah. excited. <laughs> but but um, but the design of the space is really important. And if you design a space that people will want to go to, that is more like spa, a spa like atmosphere, um, then you won't have that problem. Or I'm uh, my thesis is that it will go a long way to resolving that problem. Right. So that, that's really what I describe in the book and the seven domains and how do you um, embed each of these domains into the built environment. So when you come out with it at a, as a whole, it is an environment that is uh, a, attractive, that people want to go in and that will keep them both happy, healthy, and productive. Yeah. And, you know, to kind of dive into a little, a few of those, we talk about sleep and we think sleep is we focus on what do we do right before we go to bed right but you you outline what do you do during the whole day that actually truly impacts your sleep and we know how much sleep improves health i don't know if yeah. you want to talk a little bit about that yeah so so one of the chapters is on sleep and uh and yes it's sort of counterintuitive but it's what you do in the day especially in the morning 
um, that helps you sleep at night. So the big thing is exposure to full spectrum sunlight. So circadian sunlight. And how do you do that? Well, as designers, you put in windows, yeah. right? Um, now there's all there's offsets to putting in big windows in the desert, right? You have that problem, right. you have that problem <laughs> in Tucson, but there are there are technological solutions to that. You know, the smart glass, tinted glass, shades on the outside. Uh, plantings for shade, uh, the orientation of the building, and so on. But but really, full spectrum sunlight from 8 a.m. to 12 noon, or if you wake up earlier, from earlier to 12 noon, is really important for healthy sleep. So you fall asleep faster if you've been exposed to that light early in the day. You have a better sleep quality, and you wake up with in a better mood and more refreshed. Yeah. So I yeah. spoke earlier about you know movement. The more you move during the day, the less stressed mm -hmm. you are at night the better the sleep quality. So movement is really important. Again, designing spaces so that people move more, whether it's open office design or pleasant staircases, or you just mentioned earlier, places where people can access nature, go out for a few moments and access nature, walk around. So, you know, you, you don't think about the building only as what's inside the building, but what's around the building. Mm -hmm. If you have the luxury to have um, plantings or or a bit of a garden around, um, you know that's that's great. If not, it's nice to be near uh, accessible spaces where there's nature. Right. And I think Teresa, we do we have another question? Yeah. I think it's related to yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bring um, So you talked about having the idea of having gardens outside, uh, as you can see what behind both Jason and I, we have a lot of plants in our office. Um, have you found that indoor plant life is just as uh, helpful in reducing stressors or what is the impact that plants have in an plants, office environment? Plants, plants are really important too. Having green, whether it's outside or whether it's inside and whether it's uh, real plants or whether it's virtual reality, immersive reality. And I talk about this in the book mm. um, about a young woman who had, uh, Morel Phillips, who had been in the video game industry and she was uh, in a bad accident, had neurotrauma, was desperate to be in nature. In, she was in and out of hospital and couldn't be in nature. And after mm. she recovered, she created a studio, studio elsewhere in New York City to create immersive nature environments for people in hospitals and that was in 2019 mm. and in 2020 she found herself and you know uh in new york at the epicenter of covid burnout and even suicidality amongst healthcare workers mm. so she quickly ramped up to create uh now 60 different recharge rooms across the country with over a million users and that the use of those re nature recharge rooms. So you sit in this quiet space and you call out elsewhere, take me to a quiet mountain lake. And all of a sudden the whole wall becomes a quiet mountain <laughs> lake. And it's very calming. And she's finding that people have less anxiety, less stress, less depression, less burnout, better sleep quality and, and so on. If they are experiencing this only 15 minutes a day. So that's mm. another thing that's important. Um, I think that the organizations need to recognize that giving people a moment to go offline, whether it's being in nature, being experiencing this virtual reality, um, finding a space to contemplate or meditate or be quiet, that's not being lazy. You know, that is mm. necessary to recharge uh, and to then perform at peak. Yeah. And I, I think. There, there's something you said that you, the ideas you provide in your book, like sometimes a window, you can't have a window. You might be in a particular situation, you can't, but you can have a, a desk lamp that mimics yes. the circadian rhythm, blue light and red light, correct? Right? Like, yeah, um, absolutely. This was studies by Mariana Figuero on, uh, she was at Rensselaer Polytechnic and now is at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, she did studies with submariners with the Navy and submariners can be for months under under the ocean in their submarines and uh, did exactly that created um, um, uh, blue light desk lights um, in mm -hmm. the that then change over the period of the day so it 
gets into red light in the evening. Yeah. Yeah. Since since you uh, since I read that, I'm now changing on my iPhone. So if I <laughs> do have to look at my phone at night, I have the nighttime setting. It's but, warm light. I have to say, I got to sleep much <laughs> easier. <laughs> Well, so it's really important. So that's the, the flip side of that is that uh, if you're exposed to bright blue light and circadian light at night, it will keep you up as much as a cup of coffee just before you go to bed. So wow. it is important to, to set your computer or your, your phone. It's better not to look at your computer just before Correct. you go your yeah. smartphone. But if you must, it's better to set it so that it goes in the evening to this sort of redder light. But the other thing you can do is you can get glasses. Um, and I'm going to mm. show you this pair of glasses here. Um, I don't know if you can see that, um, yes. which have uh, uh, blue absorbing um, uh, filters on the, the lenses. Mm. You can't tell they look clear. But in order for me to remember which pair of glasses I should wear <laughs> in the evening, I had blue frames put on these glasses so that I don't mix it up and have the blue ones in the morning. So um, you can do that as well. Uh, those are uh, great, great ideas. And uh, I think a lot of us that they're easy, easy for us to attain, right? Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, just a little bit ago about, you know, you're in the Sonoran Desert, and we're in the Mojave Desert. And so one of the next things I want to dive into is this notion of humidity. Uh, we're in very, extremely dry climates. And um, we uh, since moving into our new office, we've installed all these air monitors throughout the space. And the one thing that keeps coming back to us is we're at 17% humidity. <laughs> and yeah, and um, oddly enough, uh, it's just where it is. And now we, we've had a nice reprieve because it's been raining and we've, we've caught a, a, the air quality is great. But can yeah. you talk about the importance of humidity? So this was another thing that we found in the studies with the GSA. Again, surprising, but mm -hmm. we found that people that uh, people who were in uh, conditions where the humidity was less than thirty percent relative humidity, or greater than sixty percent relative humidity. So that's you know the ASHRAE standards are thirty to sixty percent, but there's a lot of drift. Uh, in buildings, and partly it's because of the sustainable sustainability, the energy saving that's needed. You know, there's a lot of energy expenditure to dehumidify and to humidify, mm -hmm. and to humidify, and then not have mold grow in the humid in the humidifiers, and so on. So uh, we found that people in those settings where it was less than thirty percent relative humidity had twenty five percent higher stress levels. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of L increased stress. Again, they were not aware of it. And uh, we think it has something to do with mucous membranes drying out and the body sort of working really hard to keep you um, in balance. Um, mm. So what's the solution? Um, local humidifiers. Put a local humidifier on your desk. Have a local humidifier when you're sleeping. Um, and, you know, that way you don't have to, of course, you have to clean the humidifier out and change the right. water. But but that avoids the problem. And, and again, it speaks to individual spaces. We need to design for individual spaces to optimize space around each individual to the extent possible. And that's another great point. Um, I also learned is we can have an air monitor across the room, but what's happening right where I'm sitting most of my day in my local space if I'm tied to a computer for any significant amount of time. Well, this um, is what led us to to do the studies with carbon dioxide. So, yeah. you know, the more people that there are in a space, the um, uh, the more car you breathe out and you're breathing out carbon dioxide. So the longer the people are in a low ventilation space and the more people there are, the higher the carbon dioxide content in mm -hmm. that space. Well, if you're measuring the carbon dioxide up on the ceiling, it's not telling you what's happening right around you. Um, so in our studies with the GSA, we discovered this carbon dioxide bubble around one's face uh, that um, can accumulate, accumulate if you're sitting there for a long time. And one easy way to get rid of it is to have a local fan next to your computer, or even better, get up and walk around. <laughs> <laughs> Go outside for a bit. And, and that'll dissipate the carbon dioxide. Now, why is that important? Because the more carbon dioxide there is in the air, 
uh, around you, uh, the um, more fatigued you'll be, um, the lower your cognitive performance um, at levels of about 900 parts per million, cognitive performance goes down to mm. about 85%. And at 15 parts per million, it goes down to about 50%. And wow. when I'm speaking to students, I like to say that if you're falling asleep in this lecture room, it's not because I'm boring. It's because the ventilation is boring. <laughs> I like that excuse I, when you start <laughs> using that. <laughs> um, Teresa, I know we have a few more questions. If you want to ask them, it'd be great. Yeah, I thought I'd jump in with this. Um, what you were talking, when you were talking about uh, light, you talked about uh, ways to synthetically uh, recreate daylight if you don't have access to that. I think humidifiers kind of do a similar thing. We have a question about, are you seeing any other exciting developments in technology or synthetic features that can be incorporated in a built environment to reduce some of these other natural stress or uh, that re could uh, replace a natural stress reliever? That's, that's, that's a one. great question. So there's a lot. I mean, this is the future. So again, the book starts in the first part of the book. I talk about how we all got together to do this research. The middle part is each of the domains of integrative health and how those seven chapters, how do you embed integrative health into the built environment? And the third part of the book is the future. And it's really exciting. This is a really exciting time to be in this business because there's tremendous uh, number of technologies that are being developed for individualized spaces. So just think about your chair. Um, we didn't, we talked about humidity. We didn't talk about temperature. Um, you know, people have very different comfort levels, thermal comfort levels. There's many chairs now, office chairs that are available now with different uh, temperature settings. You know, we've had, well, in, in, uh, Las Vegas, you don't need these, but for, I'm from Montreal and we had uh, seat heaters in the car for, for decades. Mm -hmm. So why not put them in an office chair? So that's being done now. But there's yeah. also at the cutting edge of research uh, on material science. Um, there are researchers, uh, there was a researcher who recently left the University of Arizona, Alethea Ida, who was developing um, biosensitive materials for optimal temperature uh, and humidity in um, chairs and wall coverings and so on. So there's there's a lot of technologies that are, are really exciting that are addressing mm -hmm. each of these different needs. Right. And I think we have a couple more, right, Teresa? Uh, thank you yeah. for the answer. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we have a, a question I think relates back to your the tenet of movement. Um, you say in your book that sitting is the new smoking. Um, yes. Can you talk a little bit about that notion? <laughs> well, it's true. I didn't coin that term, but um, it, people who are more sedentary, who are not moving about as much during the day, are more prone to a variety of diseases like uh, obesity, um, diabetes, heart disease. Um, and um, and we do tend to be more sedentary now than uh, than we used to be. So again, designing the environment to encourage people to move more uh, will help mitigate those those issues. We have another one, Teresa. Um, yeah, yeah, I think we. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Um. When we're talking about uh, this being a new idea, like th this is really gaining traction after COVID, do you see this as something, like how do you see this um, impacting education or how, or the design profession? Like, I know you spoke a little bit about some of the standards that you can use uh, beyond code to measure wellness, but how are you seeing this impacting the well, so there's no question that education is essential. Education at all levels of design professionals and also education and information of the C-suite to know that this is important. And you're right, um, before COVID, um, I think that the, the priorities um, 
um, in organizations for spending money for health and well-being were very low on the on the budget sheet. And with COVID, there was a tremendous increase in demand from people, workers, uh, occupants of buildings for healthy buildings. And so that has skyrocketed and that's really wonderful, but we still need to um, um, educate and inform <clears throat> um, our design professionals as well as the C-suite. So we have at the University of Arizona, uh, Dr. Altoff engineer is our architect uh, lead um, for curriculum at uh, the College of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture for uh, whether it's undergraduates, masters, and so on, on health and the built environment. And one of the things that is really wonderful, and I talk about this in the book, and I know we only have a couple of minutes more, but I wanted to mention this um, as a practical experience uh, for students. Um, we are moving into a new building complex at the uh, Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine, which we designed from the get-go with these seven domains of integrative health embedded mm -hmm. in them. And we have a mind build building, a body building, and a spirit building. And mm -hmm. um, I won't go into all of the ways, again, it's in the book that we, we embedded these seven domains in the spaces, but we have spaces for uh, Tai Chi, for yoga, for meditation, um, uh, a labyrinth for walking meditation. We have plantings, desert plantings around the building. Um, and uh, it's really exciting because I'm going to be taking students on tours of these buildings to show them how you actually embed these uh, seven domains okay. of integrated health yeah. into the built environment. Yeah. I think one of the most unique things about the seven domains is they're all related to each other in some yes. sense. Yes, you can't separate them out. You, you can't. And you can't talk about them in silos because you just talked about movement, the importance of the movement. And, you know, for us, when you get up and move, you're going to run into a coworker and, and work on making the relationship, which is also right. a, a, another domain. So yeah. these things all kind of work together. I want, Teresa, um, we put a little slide together of our new office. I, I think it'll be great to. Oh, that's to great. You showed it to me and I think it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I love the baffles on the ceiling, which are also green and make you feel like you're in a forest. Yeah, and I don't think we talked about the idea of biophilia and, and some of the patterns of nature and how important those are. Um, yes, that's yeah. really, and, that's the environment chapter of my book talks about it, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the big change for us is different ways of working in, in places that are not traditional workspaces. Um, you know, connection to the outdoor, roll-up doors, uh, sliding glass doors that open up to a small courtyard, uh, open lounge areas, tables for collaboration and working together, quiet areas for speaking, and then places for bigger connections and bringing people together. Um, it's It's uh, been a big energy boost for our, our organization and our culture. And uh, I so even, even so, there's things we're still learning. And so I see us adapting in this space uh, over the next decade, um, finding ways to create a more healthy uh, and place that serves our employees and the people that come and go from the space. So I, I think that's wonderful. Uh, I think it's really wonderful. And as you said, it's energizing for the employees and uh, you don't have to mandate them to go to work. They want to come. Yeah, that's the goal. I mean, and I did like the importance of being together, how uh -huh. important, important that is. And that definitely doesn't happen if we spend most of our time at home. And, uh, well, so and that, that was when I, I didn't mention in the Forbes inter, in the Forbes survey, they found that what's the big reason that people want to go into work is for these relationships. And right. what's the big downside of working from home, even though you are more productive in a quiet home atmosphere, if you have the luxury to have that, uh, there is a tremendous uh, percentage of burnout and loneliness mm. from people working only from home talking to people on Zoom, on on these video conferencing so um so there is an advantage and we have to think about the workplace uh, in a different way it needs to be designed to optimize those relationships um rather than to um have a bunch of cubicles with six foot high walls yeah thank you um i think we're we're getting towards the end uh 
there is a couple questions and what we tend to do is if we can't get to them in the chat we'll when we send the the email out with the link to the recording we'll we'll try to answer them that way um i want to there was a question and here's your here's your answer uh where can you learn more uh this is uh, <laughs> Take out your cameras and uh, scan the QR code. Uh, it'll take you a link to purchase the book. Uh, we'll also provide this link in the uh, email we send out after this chat. So um, take a look. It's a great reference. Uh, it, like we mentioned earlier, it's it's for the layperson or the professional. It, it works both ways because there's there's tips and applications that you can apply uh, at home, your home office, uh, your home in general, your workplace, uh, anywhere you spend a significant amount of time, um, it's well worth it. So uh, thank you all for joining. A uh, huge thank you to Esther for coming back and having a lovely conversation with us. Um, really, really appreciate been, your time. Really been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me back. And um, I really thrilled that you were able to use some of these principles in designing your spaces. Thank you. Yeah, it, you know, you're welcome. And oh, thank you. Thanks to you, because I think uh, we're, we're we're trying to create a happy place. Maybe not Disneyland happy, but we're we're trying <laughs> we're trying to do it. Uh, Teresa, thank you for uh, facilitating moderating today, and uh, and thank you all. Um, have a good night. Good night. Goodbye. Thank you. Good night.